will take the politics of the working class into the township. Party because I felt that the Communist Party was the vanguard of the working people of South Africa. Of course, not only for the workers, it's for everybody, uh, students, uh, businessmen, and so on. But the vanguard of the working people, who are the working class people, who are, uh, have got class consciousness, is being guided by the Communist Party of South Africa. The importance of the guiding part, of the leading part of our party, is shown very much today. It is of very great importance, more especially under the present circumstances. When all the workers, all the oppressed people of our country are up in arms, you know, against the, the racist apartheid regime. Well, it, <coughs> it's important that uh, the working class of our country firstly must fight against uh, race discrimination and uh, national oppression. That is, it is in the interest because we know that race discrimination and oppression is in the interest of the factory owners and companies and very few individuals who own the capital, the riches of South Africa. Whereas these riches are created by the workers themselves. That is why it is important that they must first start by fighting for their rights against national oppression. They must also fight for their economic interests also, combining the two struggles. The fact that the workers are fighting is a sign that uh, the two stages of a revolution are not separate stages but are interlinked stages because these are very same people who are fighting against one and the same enemy. The assumption of power by the working people of the Soviet Union had special significance for our own working people and for our oppressed. We know the, the description of Tsarist Russia as a prison house of nations and the 20th century sweep towards self-determination of oppressed nationalities, towards national liberation, truly began with the October Revolution. Another impact of the way in which power was wielded in the Soviet Union was the display of an unprecedented and unending attitude of solidarity with our struggle from the Soviet Bolsheviks. And it has not only been support uh, in the ideological sense for those who are communists in South Africa, it has been support to every level of the national movement. We are the product of our own history. And if you look at the different stages of our growth, you will see that they reflect uh, the different phases of South Africa's socio-economic development. Uh, the most important factor to bear in mind about these early communists, about the early years after the party's formation, is that it was born in a white labor movement. And some of the early limitations of this party, of our party, reflect this reality. Its membership was overwhelmingly white. If you look at a picture of the founding conference, there's not a single black man present. It could be said that the only real proletariat which existed in South Africa and which had industrial organization was the, the white working class. The blacks had only just begun to come into the urban areas 
as industrial workers. And they were a long way from establishing the kind of mass working class trade union organizations which the white workers had created. Also, we must not look upon the white working class of the early 20s in the same way as we look upon them today. They had not yet completely sold out. They had not yet been co-opted as part of the ruling establishment in an auxiliary role, of course. They were still engaged from time to time in the most militant and violent struggle against the employers. What I want to say is that we cannot judge these early pioneers of socialism in South Africa by today's standards. It would be unhistorical to do so. And in fact, it is their groping towards a socialist policy, towards working class organization in the true sense. It is this which laid the very foundation in South Africa of non-racialism, the foundation of internationalism, the foundation of socialism and communism in our country. People like Ivor Jones, Percy Bunting, Bill Andrews and others perhaps deserve among the greatest honors which history can bestow in relation to the launching of a genuine working class movement in South Africa. In any case, what they achieved uh, was so healthy in substance that within a short time, the newly established party really began to reflect uh, the true content of South Africa's social structure. And before the decade of the 20s ended, the party's membership and the party's strategic approaches underwent the most fundamental changes. Uh, by 1928, which is seven years after its formation, the party's membership was 1,750 of whom 1,600 were African. By 1930, the Secretary General of the party was an African, Albert Nzulu. Also by that time, it was the party that shifted away from its confusion on the question of the role of the white working class and its approach to the question of the relation between national and class struggle and opted for a slogan which had been discussed by the common term, the slogan of the independent native republic. From then on, it could be said that the party, by adopting the slogan, by pushing for uh, a struggle which would achieve democracy in South Africa, freedom for the majority of the oppressed, that it really was a pioneer of black consciousness. In the 30s, the party, as part of the general struggle against fascism, which was emerging as one of the important questions, not only in Europe, but throughout the world, became active in an attempt to advance the whole concept of united front politics, of unity in action between all the forces. And in a sense, too, this was a forerunner, one might say, of the developments which later took place, which led to the establishment of the Congress Alliance. My involvement with the Congress movement and other progressive organization goes far back as 1938. At that time, I was employed at a baking firm of which industry I was connected right up to the time. I became its trade union secretary. During that era, I joined a group called known as the Liberal Study Group. But I must mention at this stage that some of the members were involved in this study group were members of the Communist Party, and they were carrying out policies which, in my own opinion, felt they were largely building up a solid working class front. And even this kind of role was appealing to me because I felt in my own mind that ultimately it's the working class that will play a role in shaping the future of this country. In the 40s, the party concentrated its main efforts in mobilizing the people in South Africa as best it could in very difficult circumstances. 
in the struggle against Hitler fascism, because after all, it was extremely problematic to get the sympathies of the mass of the black oppressed in the struggle against fascism at a time when they themselves were experiencing most of the ingredients of what we know to be fascism. The National Bloc of the Natalian Association came out quite openly in defiance of this war campaign and called upon the workers of this province and the provinces throughout South Africa to boycott the war efforts. So in the year 1941, when the Soviet Union entered into the war, the same group of people come out openly calling upon the people now to support the war campaign because we felt the first working class state has been attacked. At the time, it might have been difficult to grasp but when one looks back on the consequences of the defeat of Hitler, the victory of the Soviet Red Army, we know that this led to perhaps the, the most extensive independence and liberation movement successes in all parts of the world, including the African continent. During this era, I must mention also that a large number of trade unions under the leadership of the party was beginning to develop and took its very, very progressively, and the working class consciousness was developing to such a rate that uh, we were ready to move into any field to take up trade union activity. I was inspired by a friend of mine who, by the name of the late J.B. Moss, who joined the trade union movement. He was at that time, you know, battling with the organization of the mines and so on. And in the course of my career in the movement, we formed what we called at the time Non-European Trade Union Council. Then the Non-European Trade Union Council now concentrated on the mine workers. And of course, you have to take into account that the, the miners of those days are not the miners of today. When they were called to the meeting to take a decision, to down their tools, all they knew was that as from such and such a day, we are not going to work. But one thing they knew was that it was for their stomach. They were hungry. They wanted food. They wanted to feed their children. And they knew that the wages that they were earning at the time were not sufficient. When the authorities realized that uh, they were not coming to work unless their demands were accepted, they stepped in with the soldiers in order to take them back to their work on the point of the gun. They assaulted them in the same way as they do today. And we were inspired by the activities of strike and we felt necessary now to launch some form of political campaign in order to bring to the notice of the government the plight of the people. And the passive resistance campaign was launched in 1946. It has a tremendous support with locally and internationally as a result of our campaign. It was the first time the Indian question was brought up at the United Nations when the Indian government supported our call for economic sanctions against South Africa, which was successfully implemented, and uh, the working class of South Africa had no regret in supporting such a campaign. Uh, there was a feeling, you know, in the non-European trade union council that as far as the international image is concerned, we were being looked upon, you know, looked at as another uh, 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 organization that is for whites, I mean for blacks, non-European non uh, trade union movement was for blacks only. And they thought we were cutting ourselves away from the mainstream of uh, the, the struggle of the workers. We therefore decided that we should open doors of our organization. And instead of calling it non-European trade union movement, it should be called South African Congress of Trade Unions, a movement that is going to take in all workers irrespective of now, the South African Congress of Trade Unions has always been an ally of the national liberation movement. They understood that uh, the, the struggle of the working people also meant that uh, they should fight for a better government, for a better world. But during the war, uh, some of the, 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 the Afrikaners who are top, you know, in parliament and so on, were sabotaging the war effort because they were supporters of Hitler. 
Therefore, when they got into power in 1948, they did not hesitate to pinpoint the party, South African Communist Party, as being the first target, because they felt that once you close it, the Communist Party, you outlaw it, then there will be no inspiration. The people of South Africa will have no one to inspire them, because the Communist Party was going further than just the idea of nationalism. It was going further than that, that people should fight for their democratic, uh, democratic uh, uh, revolution and so on. At that time, both the party and forward-looking members of the African National Congress leaders characterized the banning of the party as an attack not only on communism, but as an attack on democracy, as an attack not only on the party, but as an attack on the ANC. And we know, as a matter of history, that within 10 years, the kind of process which has begun in 1950 and the banning of the party, the outlawing of its newspapers, uh, resulted in the uh, banning of the liberation movement in general, of the ANC in particular. They therefore met together, the communist and the non-communist, to form you know, a united front of mobilizing the people against this idea of outlawing organizations of people who are oppressed. And that is where the alliance of the ANC, SATO, and the Communist Party started from. It's not something that they just formed. It's, it's something that developed from the struggle. The party reformed in the underground and continued to play its part in a very real way in the mass struggles which reached really unprecedented heights in the 50s. In the defiance campaign, in the women's anti-pass campaigns, in the Congress of the People, in the spate of successful general political strikes which took place. The reaction of the government ordering a general mobilization the show of force throughout the country. Notwithstanding our clear declaration that this campaign is being run on peaceful and non-boundary lines, there are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against the government whose reply is only savage attack on an unarmed and defenseless people. When it became clear that it was no longer possible to make advances along the old kind of non-violent extra-parliamentary struggles. Again, the party played a very important role in uh, the decision which was taken to uh, go over into the field of armed struggle, to begin to prepare for the adding to the political struggle of elements of revolutionary violence. It is important that we arm ourselves, and it is also very important for the workers that they must join this, uh, this, uh, this struggle, because the, the armed struggle is part of their struggle, it's part of the struggle in the factories. Actually, it's a continuation, it is born out of the struggles in the factories. I am thoroughly convinced <coughs> that working class people of South Africa can only be freed through an armed struggle. I say this precisely for reason that all attempts to bring this government to think for a real change has failed, and as a result they've come to a Caesar, a military wing of the ANC has given birth to, and I am sure they are quite justified because they felt it is through armed struggle we can bring about a change because South Africa in itself is building up into a vast military state, and I'm sure we cannot fight such a missionary by means of passive resistance. It was at the Fifth Congress, which was organized in underground conditions in Johannesburg, that the program of the party, the Road to South African Freedom, was adopted. This program, uh, I believe, had an enormous impact not only on the work of the party, but on the ideological content of the national struggle in South Africa. In South African conditions, you don't have to be a Marxist or a communist. You don't have to have a profound grasp of 
scientific revolutionary theory to accept that there can be no true liberation without a redistribution of South Africa's wealth. And it is because the South African situation demands political organizational expressions of the two main streams of the content of the struggle, class and national. It is because of that that the it is absolutely essential that both organizations, the Communist Party, the African National Congress, not only work together in the kind of alliance which has been expressed, but make absolutely certain that their own independence, their own public activity, the integrity of their internal processes are in no way dominated or manipulated by either of the organizations. And this has been the practice of all the famous communist revolutionary giants who have gained the status of outstanding national leaders. And this applies to the other sectors, the trade union movement. These are all figures, communist figures, who it can truly be said laid the foundation of the black trade union movement in our country, which today expresses itself in organizations like Kasatu. It applies to the Indian Congress, in which great figures like our late chairman, Comrade Yusuf Dadu, played the most signal role in transforming that organization from a narrow shopkeeper's organization, organization of Indian bourgeoisie, into a fighting nationalist movement. Comrades like Ahmed Kathrada, serving life imprisonment with Nelson Mandela, who played a most important role in strengthening the youth league of the Indian National Congress. And the same applies to the field of uh, the colored national organizations. And of course, it's well known in South Africa that as far as the white community is concerned, it has been the white communist who has become the symbol of the readiness on the part of a small minority of whites to make unconditional common cause with the struggle for liberation, to abandon uh, their privileged status and position within the white community, to risk social isolation in the cause of liberation. A man like Brown Fisher, the very epitome of Afrikanerdom in the positive sense of the term, who showed what the future should be like as far as the white community is concerned. And in the more recent period, the Soweto generation, the new group of militants that has emerged from the 76 uprising, has also contributed its quota of militant young you must understand that the question of socialism now has become an attraction to people, particularly to young people. The young people are very attracted to socialism. They want to know what it means. They go all, all out of their way to collect papers, to go to classes, to find out exactly what socialism is. You know, when you are here, everything is different. You know, the very social system itself is very different from what one is used to in South Africa. To such an extent that really one sees, lives, and I can actually say breathe if there's such a thing, socialism. It's something you really feel you should fight for. And it's an inspiration for us that uh, we know what we are fighting for. We know a thing. It's not only something we think about, but it's something that we can feel and touch. For instance, the students are studying here free of charge. They get free textbooks, and this is what we are fighting for in South Africa. And you actually see what it means when it is said that this is a workers' state. The workers themselves are taking decisions on how to run the, pro the production. 
itself, you know, it is unlike where you find that the workers are nothing else but, you know, exploited tools. They are themselves engaged in the actual planning of the production. Because they feel, mm. you can feel that they are the owners of the means of mm, production, they are the owners. of the riches of their country. of all this, of all these ravages, of all these pains, of all these bitternesses, I'm happy to say the young people, the old people, the women in Soweto, those who are in crossroads, those who are in Kwamashu, they are resisting. They are resisting and probably saying they will resist until even those who have no ears begin to hear. They will fight until those who have just been born, if we don't succeed immediately, until they themselves take up arms. 